Chapter 7. How to predict the future to eternity. I regard knowing as an active comprehension of the things known, an action that requires skill. Into every act of knowing there enters a passionate contribution of the person knowing what is being known, and that this coefficient is no mere imperfection but a vital component of his knowledge. So it is our personal participation that governs the richness of concrete experience. Michael Polanyi. In this chapter, we will consider that the whole concept of value is subjective and cannot be reduced to mathematical formula. One of the reasons for this is that valuing an equity interest in a firm involves the need to predict the future earnings of a firm to eternity. None of us can do this mathematically. The reason for this is that we cannot know for sure what the future will hold. In this chapter, we will discuss what we can do about this. We will also think about how we can deal with the interesting psychological phenomenon called risk. We will see this is another area no one has figured out how to reduce to a mathematical formula. It involves more guesses. Indeed, this chapter is about the loose ends and untidy difficulties of knowing what adds value. To know what adds value would be a great thing. But as Michael Polanyi has pointed out, knowledge is a personal thing. Also, it is something we share and develop in community, never alone. Let us now think about how we can predict for our firms the future to eternity. 7.1. Putting the guesswork into eternity. In this section, we will think about the implications of needing to value an equity interest based on our forecasts into eternity, which is a very, very long time. One of these implications is the essential need for guesswork in valuing firms. Eternity is a long time. On January 1, 2000, it was the beginning of a new millennium. This does not happen too often. In fact, it only happens every thousand years. There were scares of the millennium bug, concern that computers around the world would malfunction as each time zone around the world progressively ticked over to 2000. These were unfounded concerns, as it turned out. Never trust IT specialists, we collectively muttered at the time while also being slightly relieved. I spent New Year's Eve that year in Paihia, in the Bay of Islands, in the far north of New Zealand's North Island. It was wet and cloudy that night. Being in one of the world's first time zones, we celebrated the new year and new millennium before most people in the world. The new year and new millennium progressively rolled around the world, with impressive fireworks in the world's major cities. The fireworks in Sydney Harbour were quite spectacular and received international attention. On the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the words Eternity in neat copper plate handwriting appeared as the centrepiece at the end of the fireworks display. The same word appeared on the Sydney Harbour Bridge during the fireworks display at the end of the opening ceremony at the Olympic Games in Sydney later that year. In the early 1930s, Arthur Stace, a homeless alcoholic, started to write the words Eternity in yellow chalk on the footpaths of Sydney in the early hours of the morning. He did this for over 35 years, until his death in the late 1960s. These words were everywhere, in immaculate copper plate handwriting, on footpaths, entrances to train stations, and anywhere else he thought it would catch people's attention. They became a noticeable feature each day for Sydney siders in the city and in some of the inner suburbs, as he encouraged people to think beyond the day to day and take a moment to think about eternity. Nobody knew who wrote these words until 1956, when the identity of the person doing this, dubbed Mr. Eternity, was discovered. It, it was a nobody called Arthur Stace. He had been a homeless and alcoholic man, crazily writing the word eternity on Sydney's streets. 
Yet there was his handwriting, taken decades after his death and emblazoned across the Sydney Harbour Bridge at the dawn of the current millennium, eternity. We do not think much about eternity. It is a long time. Yet our theory of the valuation of firms and hence our conceptual framework for the practice of financial statement analysis is based on valuing dividends, cash flows or earnings for eternity. This is what an equity interest in a firm gives us. Sure, firms will not last for eternity. Eventually, firms will be either liquidated or taken over and an equity interest in the firm will cease to exist. But the final payment received for an equity interest on liquidation or from a takeover bid would be related to the view of the value of the firm or its assets at that time. This value, which would depend on the expectation of dividends, cash flows or earnings from the firm or its assets in the future, to eternity. Of course, eventually everything comes to an end. And although it may not be to eternity, some firms can last a long time. They can last decades and sometimes centuries. Our discounted cash flow DCF and economic profit valuation models, even when simplified to exclude a firm's financial activities, still requires us to forecast cash flows and abnormal operating income for eternity. I do not know about you, but I am often not sure what I'll be doing this weekend, let alone this time next year or in 10 years time or in eternity. So how can we possibly expect to be able to do this task in practice? Those participating in the capital markets of the world recognize this difficulty. Indeed, it is the difficulty of predicting the future to eternity that underpins the central difficulty of financial statement analysis and the fundamental analysis of firms. It is why we can never objectively know what a firm is worth. Yet, fortunately for us, investing equity in firms and analysing the financial statements of firms is not an absolute game. When we purchase or sell an equity interest in a firm, we purchase or sell it from someone else. It is this issue that we will now consider. Guessing better than others. All of you use information from both financial statements and other sources to evaluate the longer run economic performance of a company. You then assess whether the inherent economic value is reflected in the current stock price. But in making this assessment, your focus is not on coming up with a precise valuation, but on identifying large price to value gaps and the risks associated with the valuation estimates. Trevor Harris, Morgan Stanley. Finance theory is based, among other things, on the assumption of homogeneous expectations among all participants in the capital markets. This means that everyone thinks the same thing about the future. No one thinks this assumption is true, although finance models based on this assumption can be very useful in predicting behaviour in our capital markets. This assumption is not true because it is when people's expectations about the future diverge, when they are different, that transactions occur in the capital markets. So, when you are purchasing or selling equity interests in firms, whether in the world's listed equity markets or in the private equity markets, you are putting your capacity to predict the future to eternity against someone else's capacity. It is the great paradox of finance theory that it is possible to do this consistently and win. For this reason, financial statement analysis and fundamental analysis of firms is a worthwhile activity for equity investors. In practice, when we discuss the fundamentals of a company and how the market is likely to value the stock, we focus on the two to three years immediately ahead. We found that beyond three years, we're going too far into the fiction zone, where people's models tend to have garbage in, garbage out problems. We use a thought process that has a rolling two to three year time horizon. Andrew Lacey, 
Lazard Asset Management. The quality of our financial statement analysis will be based on the extent to which we can predict the future of a firm to eternity better than other equity investors in the capital markets. Given that many equity investors give little or no attention to this task, gaining real skills and capabilities in this aspect may give us an edge. It may allow us to know what adds value better than many others. To be able to value firms using the discounted cash flow and economic profit models, we need to be able to forecast a firm's future abnormal operating income and cash flows to eternity. We know growth in expected abnormal operating income is driven by increases in the rate of return relative to the cost of capital and by increases in the book value of equity. Usually we can only meaningfully forecast a firm's abnormal operating income for a short period, for just a few years. However, if we based our view of the value of a firm on the present value of just a few years of abnormal operating income, we would be omitting a large part of the value of the firm. An equity interest in a firm entitles the investor to returns to eternity, not just for a few years. To overcome this difficulty, we need to calculate a continuing value for a firm beyond our practical forecast horizon for forecasting abnormal operating income and cash flows. Look around where you are. Your horizon is how far you can see. Maybe a short distance, for example, if you are in a room with the blinds shut. Or a longer distance, for example, you may have a panoramic view of a harbour or a valley before you. Whether short or longer, your horizon is limited, as is your practical forecast horizon for predicting a firm's abnormal operating income and cash flows. For a discussion about the realities of a forecast horizon, see the great video Forecast Horizon. What lies beyond our forecasting horizon for our firm? The answer is, we do not know. I'll say that again, we do not know. We cannot predict it by forecasting the economic and business drivers of a firm and relating these to the firm's accounting drivers, that is to a firm's financial numbers and to a firm's value. We cannot see over the horizon of a firm's future. What lies beyond the horizon is speculation. When the initial British settlers of Wellington came in 1840, they saw that Wellington Harbour was surrounded by large, by large hills and they initially suspected that there was little flat arable land beyond those hills. They could easily imagine a continuation of the hills that they could see spreading out for long distances in all directions. Well, that was not correct, but newly arrived, sitting in Wellington Harbour in a small sailing ship after having survived a voyage halfway round the world and looking at the surrounding hills, you could only speculate as to what might lie beyond. So what do we do? The answer is, we guess. We guess because we must, and we guess because we think we can do it better than many others in the equity markets. Indeed, these guesses are the judgments we can often make better than many others, and they can be key to making money and contributing to our community by allocating capital well. But we must never forget that we are guessing and will invariably be wrong. So we will look for a margin of safety when using the results of our analysis to make investment decisions. A margin of safety is the difference between our estimate of the value of a firm and the amount we pay to purchase an equity interest in a firm. Essentially, it is this margin of safety that will make us rich as an equity investor. By skewing the risk return relationship of our equity investments in our favour. Have a look at the great video, Margin of Safety which discusses how we can view risk and make it our friend through having a margin of safety. Without doubt, having a margin of safety 
is the most important concept we will consider when studying financial statement analysis, valuation and investing. In the late 1980s, Standard and Chartered Bank in Hong Kong found itself in control of a 50% interest in a large trust that owned over 200 pubs and hotels throughout Australia, following the collapse of one of the more colourful and famous Australian entrepreneurs. They engaged the investment bank I worked for at the time to sell this interest. It seemed to us the best thing to do was to have each pub or hotel valued individually, to find out what the net asset backing of the trust was, based effectively on a liquidation value, as a starting point to deciding what the interest in the trust might be worth. We engaged a team of three experienced pub valuers to embark on this task. The pubs and hotels were spread throughout Australia, including remote locations in Australia's outback. It also happened to coincide with a major airline pilot strike in Australia, which made travelling the vast distances around Australia, well, interesting. I went with the leading pub value of the team as he inspected a few of the hotels in Sydney. Before he inspected the accounts of each hotel, he walked through the premises and took a few notes in his notebook. He then took me aside and showed me how he could calculate how much the hotel should earn based on the physical amount of alcohol purchased by the hotel, based on its official records which it submitted to the Liquor Licensing Authority, his noting of the various prices charged and his estimates of where the sales would proportionately fall in the various aspects of the hotel, bottle shop, public bar and so forth. And in the corner of the public bar of each of these hotels, were a few poker or gaming machines. I talked to the manager of one of the hotels. He said the gaming machines were amazing. They would open the back of the gaming machines every few days and empty out enormous amounts of cash, close them up again, and then in a few days, open the back of them again and empty out enormous amounts of cash, and so on and on. Indeed, it was not unusual in the late 1980s for about one half of the value of each pub or hotel in Australia to be related to the profits earned from a few gaming machines sitting in one corner of their premises. The point of the story is this. The reason the manager of the hotel could open the back of the gaming machines and regularly have a lot of cash come out was because the odds of winning in the gaming machines were set in favour of the house. The odds were stacked in their favour. Play a gaming machine long enough and you will lose. And the house will win, guaranteed. Anyone who has played gaming machines would be all too aware of this harsh reality. The idea of having a significant margin of safety is the same idea as a hotel having its gaming machines programmed to have the odds in its favour. However, the hotel owner controls the environment. They can set the odds on their gaming machines to ensure the house wins. We do not control the environment of firms. Indeed, we have only a very limited understanding of what the future may hold for a firm. A firm is certainly not like a gaming machine in that respect. We cannot open the back of a firm and see how it has been programmed to produce abnormal operating income into the future. Well, not exactly, but we can open the back of firms. Financial statement analysis is a key skill. We need to be able to do this and see how our firms tick, how they are programmed, how their business model is working to provide equity investors with abnormal operating income. But firms are not machines. We know that because firms involve people, also, while a gaming machine functions as an independent machine, firms do not. Firms operate in various marketplaces in which they compete and interact with various other parties, more people. There are also a wide range of factors that can impact on firms that are beyond the control of any person or group of people. So we seek to skew the odds in our favour by having a margin of safety. However, there will always be considerable uncertainty and risk 
so we want a large margin of safety. We've seen the need for guesswork in analysing financial statements as we move beyond our forecast horizon and extend our imaginations into eternity. We need to estimate continuing values for firms on the edge of our forecast horizon to capture our speculation about what may lie beyond. In the next section, we'll look at how we can practically determine continuing values when calculating the present value of abnormal operating income and the value of a firm. 7.2 Continuing Values I think there is a real arbitrage opportunity for investors willing to look out three, four or five years. Michael Mabusen, Leg Mason. This section is about how we can determine a measure for what we do not know. We have seen in previous chapters that our economic profit model is value of equity equals the book value of equity plus the present value of abnormal operating income. Now the present value of abnormal operating income equals abnormal operating income in year one divided by WAC plus abnormal operating income year two divided by WAC squared plus abnormal operating income in year three divided by WAC cubed plus dot dot dot. In other words, the present value of abnormal operating income is calculated by discounting the expected future abnormal operating income of a firm for eternity by the required rate of return for operations, that is the weighted average cost of capital, WAC. However, it is only practical to forecast abnormal operating income for a firm for a relatively short period of time, for just a few years. This is called the forecast horizon. How far we can see into the future will vary for different firms, but there will always be a limit, a horizon. We can conceive the value of the equity in a firm to be value of equity equals the book value of equity plus abnormal operating income in year one divided by WAC plus abnormal operating income in year two divided by WAC squared, plus dot dot dot, plus abnormal operating income in year T, divided by WAC to the power T, plus the continuing value in year two T, divided by WAC to the power of T. Where the forecast horizon is to period T, and the continuing value, CV little t, is the value of the firm's equity at the end of the forecast horizon. Now, does this simply mean we have transferred our problem of valuing an earnings stream into eternity, as at the present date, into a problem of valuing an earnings stream into eternity as at a future date, that is, in period T? The answer to this question is, well, yes. But what we have achieved by doing this is to separate clearly what we can reasonably estimate based on information we can critically analyse, that is book value of equity and abnormal operating income year one, abnormal operating income year two, and so on to abnormal operating income in year T, from what we cannot, that is continuing value in year T. It is not possible to know the future but within the constraints of our forecast, we can make convincing, sensible, sound estimates about the future based on a clear understanding of the economic and business drivers of a firm and our forecasts of these drivers. To the extent we can do this, our estimates of value are grounded in reality and can be subject to the discipline of critical discussion and review by us and by others. What distinguishes a crank or mad person in our capital markets from a financial genius. For example, Copernicus was not a crank. He was Polish and lived in the late 15th and early 16th centuries and proposed that the earth rotated, rotated around a stationary sun rather than the other way around. This whole issue seems quite quaint to us today. To conceive of the sun or the earth as stationary or as the centre of the universe, is both odd and irrelevant.
Any point in the universe, including the Earth and Sun, could be used as a fixed point, should we wish to think of it that way, and the rest of the universe considered as related to this point. However, it was a big issue in 16th century Europe. For example, the Christian religious authorities at the time were concerned the notion of the Earth rotating around the Sun would encourage a return to Sun worship by some people. But why was Copernicus not a crank? It was not because he was correct in his ideas. Our current understanding perceives a universe of almost infinite scale, that is, really big, compared to our relatively small Sun's minor solar system on the edge of the Milky Way. We now see the Sun as not the centre of the universe. However, even though Copernicus was to be later proved wrong, he was not a crank, because he was highly critical of his own ideas which he rigorously and carefully questioned and examined in the light of possible and practical astronomical observations. In the same way, our discounted cash flow and economic profit models are both based on a theory or idea that can help us focus our critical examination of a firm's financial statements and of other information that we may have on a firm to help us understand the economic and business drivers of a firm. This theory can provide us with a framework or a way of thinking that can help us focus our efforts on rigorously assessing the information we have to form a view on the value of a firm. This can increase our confidence in our assessments and give us a solid foundation on which to stand in making decisions on how to allocate our scarce capital into equity investments in firms. As we have seen in previous chapters, financial statement analysis can be a key part of a fundamental analysis of a firm. However, an analysis based on our discounted cash flow and economic profit frameworks does not give the complete or correct answer. One reason for this is the limitations of our horizon. We can only practically see so far. Beyond that, it is pure conjecture. As we have mentioned previously, there is value in separating what is based on analysis of relatively objective information, things we can to some extent know, and what is speculation, judgments based on what we do not know, or on guesses or hunches. By clearly separating that part of our analysis based on careful assessments from those based on speculation, we can identify and limit the amount of speculation and sentiment, for example, fear and greed, that can easily drive our capital markets, particularly at certain times. Remember, our capital markets effectively trade in expectations or dreams about the future. In this way, we can make better capital allocation decisions ourselves and be part of an overall capital market climate that can lead to better capital allocation decisions more generally by market participants. This would have considerable social and economic benefits in any community. Notice that our expression achieves this separation. Value of equity equals book value of equity plus abnormal operating income year one divided by WAC plus abnormal operating income in year two divided by WAC squared plus dot 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 plus abnormal operating income in year T divided by WAC to the power T plus continuing value in year T divided by WAC to the power T. The continuing value CV little t is based on speculation. Whereas the current book value of equity and our forecast of abnormal operating income, we can critically analyse, discuss and assess in some degree of detail. So how do we arrive at a continuing value for a firm when using an economic profit model to estimate a firm's value? When the early British settlers in Wellington in 1840 had landed and set up their first homes and were thinking further about what might lie beyond their immediate horizon of the rugged hills surrounding Wellington Harbour, they may have thought about a few possible scenarios. Perhaps those early British settlers thought that the rugged hills continued for a long distance in all directions, 
that is no arable land nearby. Or perhaps that there was some flat arable land to the east only, that is some arable land nearby. Or perhaps that there was extensive arable land behind all the hills, that is large amounts of arable land nearby. They probably did not seek to form scenarios or speculations that there might be arable land of a certain specific type or of various heights above sea level, or with thick forests or open plains or any of a wide range of specific possibilities. There was no point in doing this, since they did not know anything about what might lie over the hills and ranges. Indeed, given the rugged nature of the immediate environment, they were not too hopeful that there would prove to be any arable land at all beyond their horizon. We can do the same when thinking what might lie beyond our forecast horizon for a firm. It is most effective to simply make some broad assumptions beyond those periods where we can forecast abnormal operating income. The formulas for continuing value we have incorporated into the spreadsheets in this unit are discounted cash flow model, continuing value little t equals operating income t plus one, or times 1 minus brackets G divided by RINOA, return on incremental net operating assets, close brackets, or divided by weighted average cost of capital minus G. And the economic profit continuing value is CV little t equals economic profit in year T plus 1 divided by WAC plus operating income in T plus 1 times brackets G divided by RINOA, return on incremental net operating assets, close brackets, and then another bracket, return on incremental net operating assets minus WAC, close brackets, all divided by WAC minus G, where G is the expected growth rate in operating income OI, that's the expected growth rate in operating income past the forecast horizon, and return on incremental net operating assets, RINOA, is the expected rate of return on incremental net operating assets that is on new invested capital in the future beyond the forecast horizon. These continuing values are perpetuity-based formulas with constant growth, margins, asset turnover, and WAC. Both CV both continuing value formulas make explicit the assumptions about return on incremental net operating assets, the expected rate of return on incremental net operating assets that is on new invested capital, invested after the forecast period. Although the continuing value differs between the discounted cash flow and economic profit models, the value of a firm will be the same with either model, given the same projected financial performance. Under the economic profit model, the continuing value formula is the present value of economic profit in the first year after the forecast period in perpetuity, plus an incremental economic profit after that year based on additional investment in net operating assets at returns exceeding the cost of capital. If expected return on incremental net operating assets equals WAC, then the second half of the continuing value formula for the economic profit model is zero, and the continuing value is the first year's economic profit in perpetuity. Remember the early British settlers in Wellington probably did not seek to generate detailed scenarios in their minds about what might lie beyond their immediate horizon of the rugged hills surrounding Wellington Harbour. At least there was no point in doing this. If someone had the time, they might have imagined detailed visions of streams or waterfalls in picturesque small valleys, or details of potential rock formations that may or may not exist beyond the hills. But it is unlikely they did. They were too busy ensuring their survival, deciding where to establish the town, grow crops, build houses, even how to survive some early earthquakes. In terms of speculating about what might lie beyond the hills, beyond their horizon, they needed to stick to broad generalities or possibilities. 
The key issue for them was how much, if any, arable land might lie over the hills. It's the same with financial statement analysis. We have limited time and energy to devote to analysing firms. We need to focus on the key aspects that will affect value. There are several issues involved in selecting continuing value scenarios and a few traps for the unwary. These issues and traps generally relate to being overconfident about our ability to predict what lies beyond our forecast horizon. We should always remind ourselves that we do not know what lies beyond our horizons. It may or may not be a pot of gold. Indeed, even if there is a pot of gold, given the likelihood of mean reversion in most markets most of the time, it probably will not stay that way after enough elapse of time. A key trap in selecting a continuing value scenario is to assume the past will continue indefinitely into the future. We can do this where a firm has strong or poor existing growth. If a firm is providing strong growth in abnormal operating income, then it is likely it will not be able to continue to do this indefinitely. In the case of Ryman Healthcare, other competitors could be expected to enter their markets. Customer acceptance of the sale of occupation rights might change, perhaps stimulated by competitive behaviour, and the market for retirement village units may one day become saturated and the opportunities for future growth reduce. At one extreme, once every person over 75 years of age is living in a retirement village, the opportunities for growth will be much less. A slowdown in growth is inevitable eventually. Also, demographic factors such as an ageing population in New Zealand and Australia will eventually reverse as the baby boomer generation dies in the next 20 to 40 years. However, some firms do manage to provide a large and growing abnormal operating income for long periods of time. For example, Ryman Healthcare has been performing strongly since its listing in 1999. A few companies do manage to buck the trend of mean reversion of returns for quite long periods, but usually it's only a few, and mean reversion will eventually catch up with them too, even Ryman Healthcare. Factors that suggest Ryman Healthcare may be able to maintain and grow its high level of abnormal operating in income include the element of local monopoly held by individual retirement villages due to the difficulty of securing suitable sites in appropriate residential areas. In this respect, they are similar to regional shopping centres. And the business model of Ryman Healthcare, which has built in growth as it is able to resell occupation rights in its retirement village units and also grow its deferred management fees. The business model used by Ryman Healthcare means some aspects of Ryman Healthcare's business are easier to predict than is the case for many firms. It is almost as if there are a few gaps in the hills around Wellington Harbour that allow us to see a few years further for Ryman Healthcare than we can see for many other firms. Indeed, it is relatively easier to predict abnormal operating income for firms with established and proven business models in strongly growing markets where they can extend and develop their activities using their existing business models than it is for firms facing more significant change and unpredictability in their markets and environment. We have seen one trap in selecting a continuing value for a firm is to assume the past will continue indefinitely into the future. Another trap is to fail to carry out sensitivities in our calculation of a firm's continuing value. We should conduct sensitivities over a wide range of possible scenarios. This will help to give us a feel for the possible valuation ranges for a firm based on changes to the primarily speculative elements of our valuation. This may also suggest the range of prices at which it may be possible to transact in a firm's equity, both in terms of buying when sentiment is more negative and of selling when sentiment is more positive. Also, explicitly considering the makeup of a continuing value can be particularly useful in assessing the apparent reasonableness of the listed share price of a firm or any price offered 
by the, for the equity of a private firm. We can use the economic profit model to determine the growth rate beyond the forecast horizon that is implicit in the share price of a firm. We can then assess the reasonableness of this implied growth rate, which can help us identify where speculation and sentiment may be outweighing an intelligent assessment of the value of a firm. For example, we could run a set of sensitivities on the growth rate we use in the continuing value. Forming considered and well thought through views about the appropriate growth rate to use in our continuing value is important. It can often be important to discuss issues around a firm's appropriate growth rate with others with thought and analysis going into this as best we can. There may be some useful long-range forecasts for residential property values or other economic data that we might find useful in thinking about what might lie beyond our forecast horizon for Ryman Healthcare and how best to handle our calculation of a continuing value. We can also complete various sensitivity analyses concerning our forecasts of abnormal operating income changing our forecasts of sales, asset turnover and profit margin and other factors in various ways to gauge their effects on our view of the value of a firm. For example, we could run sensitivities for Ryman Healthcare with different forecasts of residential property values and with different property revaluation forecasts and with changes in the level of sales of occupation rights. Such an analysis would show that our economic profit valuation of Ryman Healthcare is highly sensitive to changes in our forecasts of residential property values and somewhat sensitive to our forecast of sales of occupation rights. This suggests we should put effort into our forecast of residential property values as our judgments around this factor will have a significant impact on our assessment of the value of Ryman Healthcare using our economic profit framework. We have examined some of the issues about how to analyse the book value of equity, make abnormal operating income forecasts, and calculate continuing values. The remaining aspect to consider when using discounted cash flow and economic profit frameworks is the discount rate to use. The weighted average cost of capital, WAC, the cost of capital for operations. This is related to the risk of the firm's business activities. In the next section, we will look at this remaining aspect to our model, the interesting psychological phenomenon called risk.